Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Joy and I'm working as the Philippine Program Assistant of the Environmental Leadership and Training Initiative based at the Visayas State University, Leyte, Philippines. And today I am joined by my colleague, David Nidal, who is the LTE Asia Advisor, and Jillian Bloomfield, who is the LTE Online Training Program Coordinator. And both of them are based in the US. So now we are pleased to welcome you today to the fifth webinar in this eight parts webinar series, Forest Landscape and, Land Forest and Landscape Restoration in Practice. So through this series, we are celebrating the experiences and perspectives of alumni of LP's 15 years of capacity development and training. So for those of you who aren't familiar with LT, LT is an initiative of Yale University's School of the Environment, which receives generous support from Arcadia, a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin. So we are a global team of individuals and partner institutions who work to train and support people from all sectors and backgrounds to restore and conserve tropical forest landscapes using strategies that support biodiversity and livelihoods. Okay, so for uh, our theme of today's webinar is working across the stakeholders in the Philippines. So we are pleased to be joined to be joined, uh, LT alumni Fadeus Martinez, who participated in a regional forest restoration training with LT in Chiang Mai, Thailand in 2010, and now facilitates familiar, uh, similar types of trainings, training events. And we are also thrilled to be joined by Rene Vendiola, who turned the area around his house into a small forest and who has been a very active advocate of rainforestation on the island of Negro since 2009. Okay, so to avoid issues with connectivity and to provide access to subtitles, Thaddeus and Rene have kindly pre-recorded their short presentations and will hear both presentations and then have a chance for a short discussion altogether. So this session is being recorded and will be sent out by email in the next few days, as well as posted to LT's YouTube channel. And if you have questions, please write them using the Q&A feature, and we will get to some at the end of the session. Also, please feel free to take a look at the chat where David and I will be posting relevant links and resources. So, uh, with no further ado, we'll start with Thaddeus Martinez. So, Sir Thaddy is currently working as head of the Natural Resources Management Division, or NRMD, of Haribon Foundation, where he obtained 11 years of experience as technical personnel and now the program coordinator. So, as head of the NRMD, he ensures the implementation of natural resource related projects in different sites. So this includes uh, the implementation of rainforestation in all forest restoration projects of Haribon, including the forests of for life movement or FFL prior to being employed with Haribon. So he spent eight years working as a farm supervisor for two landscaping firms and three years of project leader in the Makiling Banaha Watershed Area Team Unit. So you under the Watershed Management Dep Department of the National Power Corporation in the Philippines. So we will now share Tadi's presentation about his work with Haribon promoting rainforestation. Hello everyone, I am uh, Forrester Tadej Martinez and I work for Haribon Foundation. My connection to LT started way back in 2010 when uh, LT gave Haribon an opportunity to send an official representative as trainee on the Regional Forest Restoration Training Program. Uh, this program was in partnership with the Forest Restoration Research Unit or FORU 
of Chiang Mai University in Thailand. LT is also Haribon's colleague because we both belong to a network that promotes the use of our country's native trees. This is the Rainforest Restoration Initiative or the RFRI. Today, I will be presenting the local stakeholders engagement key sustainable forest restoration. Okay, so I am currently working as head of the Natural Resources Management Division or NRMD of Haribon Foundation. I have obtained 11 years of experience as technical personnel and program coordinator of Haribon. As head of NRMD, uh, I ensure the implementation of natural resource related projects in different sites. This includes the implementation of rainforestation technology in all forest restoration projects of Haribon. In, in this next slide, um, I will try to uh, explain uh, the sites that we are prioritizing for restoration. So Haribon prioritizes the key biodiversity areas or the KBA. Our KBAs are sites of global significance for the conservation of biodiversity. These are recognized as vital land, fresh water, and marine sites for threatened plants and animals. Many of the KBAs are either part or, or adjacent to our protected areas and watershed areas. And most of our restoration sites are within these two categories of government proclaimed areas. Our restoration initiatives are materialized through the Haribon's Forest for Life movement. We all do this with the help of the local stakeholders, of course. Right now, we are doing restoration initiatives in mountains Iri Tangilo and Binuang KBA uh, with the KBA number PH033. And uh, within this, this is within the stretch of the Southern Sierra Madre, particularly including Real Quezon. Uh, of course, including also the Kaliwa Watershed Forest Reserve. We are also having initiatives of restoration in mountains, Banahao, San Cristobal Protected Landscape, PBA number 47, all of which are also protected areas and also in coastal area nearest these mountains, Irid Angelo and Binoang KBA, or PH number 33 in Infanta Quezon. Haribon applies the ridge to reef approach as it implements the restoration of our forest in the uplands. It also implements the restoration of our mangrove areas. We also provide assistance to the local government units in the establishment of a marine protected area. And uh, of course, we do our forest restoration, as I have mentioned earlier. We do this restoration primarily through the Forest for Life Movement, or the FFL, and through some project funded by the different institutions. Forest for Life Movement is an environmental conservation movement that aims restore our forests using native trees. This is to recover and conserve biodiversity, eventually optimizing ecosystem services. The movement provides livelihood to the communities and partnership with the key stakeholders. In restoring our forests, it is important to consider our allies. They are the local communities. Community-based approach has been proven the best approach considering the livelihood opportunities to lessen the pressure of poverty. As we know, poverty pushes some of the local people to clutch at illegal activities just to survive and uh, these eventually destroy our natural resources. Through the Forest for Life movement, livelihood opportunities are being provided. We facilitate this through our Adapt a Seedling program, wherein tree planting activities are some of the initial efforts in every site. Its seedling planting is being maintained for three years. This is where the livelihood takes place. Uh, in every activity, 
uh, there is corresponding financial incentive from the production or supply of the native seedlings, uh, the tree planting fees, and provision of livelihood fund, land preparation, and maintenance fees. And in terms of approach, uh, we are using the community-based resource management. This is the community-based approach. Again, when talking of approach, we at Haribon is using the CBRM through which people themselves are given the opportunity uh, and the responsibility to manage their own resources. Uh, because Haribon believes that uh, the community is the best steward of their own resources. And through this CBRM or community-based resource management, the community is organized and empowered to take action for themselves. The community has a healthy and balanced ecology and uh, their natural resource-based livelihood sufficiently supplies their needs and the area is not threatened. The local economy, the local economy is healthy and there is equitable access to natural resources. Resources need not be monopolized by few. So these are the ideal scenarios that we are really trying to attain in every forest restoration site wherein we are applying a community-based approach. And um, through the years of uh, implementation, we at Haribon learned that it's not only the technical knowledge and the biotic factors that we call the diversity index and the canopy cover, et cetera, and some biotic factors which includes elevation, soil characteristics, and climate that are important. But uh, the social aspect is really very important uh, to attain the success of any conservation projects. The social preparations and social acceptance, engagement, and ownership of the communities themselves play a very big role in its success and sustainability. And as you can see in this picture, um, yes, um, uh, it is very important to have the appropriate land use supporting the restoration criteria and implementation. So we are prioritizing the protected areas and watershed areas. And um, the, the partnership is not only with the community, but also with the local government units from the municipal and barangay units, and if possible, with the provincial level. So of course, there is also the presence of the legitimate uh, community partners. Uh, and of course, the reinforestation technology wherein we use the appropriate trees that matches the site. And, um, Okay, um, so reinforestation technology, this include what I am explaining a while ago, uh, that the neural classification of the site, we really consider this and uh, we have learned a lot through the years. And uh, uh, as I have mentioned earlier, we do um, prioritizes the public lands, whether the area is government or privately owned, but um, in our experience, we also consider, of course, the community-based forest management agreement sites. And uh, of course, the protected areas, our PAs, the watersheds, and of course, the communal forest. It is very important that we do choose appropriate areas for restoration, those that have licit or legal advantage where the trees planted will not be cut and will be protected in perpetuity. Also, a very organized community partner will lead to the timely conduct of maintenance activities, which will eventually ensure high survival of the planted trees. And um, this is some of the photos we had way back in 2010, uh, 11 years ago, and uh, my, engagement, my engagement with LT capacity development that it provided way back in 2010 equipped me, honestly, the basic foundations in the proper method of restoring forest within the open and denuded lands and those that only need assisted natural regeneration. LT though, uh, taught us 
the, the that forest restoration strategy, which I should say is the same strategy with the rainforestation technology, which is which we both promote and implement in different sites. Uh, in this training, we were thought of identifying and using the framework species in the site, the forest succession, and identifying the type of forest being restored. That's very important. All of which are in the rainforestation technology where the site species matching is being done. The use of the naturally growing and finer species of trees in particular sites are being taught in our capacity building activities with our community partners and other stakeholders. And uh, biodiversity and sustained ecological benefits for the people are always being emphasized as one of the end goals of forest restoration. And I think that's all for my presentation. I, I really think LP and all of our colleagues in promoting, of course, the, the using of our native trees and appropriate technology in restoring our forests. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you also very much, Sir Tadi, for your very interesting introductory presentation on your work in promoting rainforestation. And for our next speaker, let me welcome again, uh, Sir Rene Veniola. After dropping out of high school, Rene started his career as a slash and burn farmer or kaingenero in Filipino term and hunter, but has gone on to become one of the most prominent rainforestation advocates in the Philippines. He is the founder of Liptong Woodland, a rainforestation site in Bakong Negros Oriental, where he has planted over 200 native, 200, 200 native tree species. So Rene is very active rainforestation trainer who provides environmental education to a large number of individuals and groups that visit Liptong Woodland each year. So he has also inspired and provided guidance to many local government units, NGOs, and other groups and individuals to plant native trees and engage in forest restoration. So in 2012, he won the prestigious Ramon Avoitis Foundation Inc. or RAFI Triennial Award for Exemplary individuals and has won numerous awards since. So we will now share Rene's presentation. Hello everyone. My name is Rene Tatay Itik Binjula. I de developed Liptong Woodland as a rainforestation model after I attended rainforestation training in the Visaya State University in 2006, along with 10 other participants in Negros Oriental with the help of Haribon representative, Ms. Tanya Garcia. My connection to ELPI is work related. As a trained rainforestation facilitator, I promote rainforestation farming to all individuals, mostly private landowners in Giholngan City, like engineer Fim Nelies, Mary Susan Fortitz, High School Bat 70, Barangay Magsaysay Farmers Association, Sylvia Somoza Malahay in La Libertad, Adam Nista, an Australian who bought a piece of land in Bindoy, Kim and Senya Saranillo in Bindoy and Giholngan City, Toboran Foundation, a woman NGO in Bindoy, Angelo Antiki in Bayawan City, Gary Fondrin in Dawen, Patrick Hasque of Sambongita, owner of Talata Resorts in Sambongita. Groups like the indigenous groups in Binalbagan, Negros Occidental, Cebu Mountaineering Society of Cebu, Cebu Assailants of Mountain Peak, Cebu, religious institutions like the Negros District Conference, the United Church of Christ in the Philippines, sugarcane planters like Pamela Hinades, and Daniel Gutierrez of Negros Occidental, and lately, Ayon Mapa in Tanay City of Negros Oriental, as well as local government units like Bakong, my hometown, Foundation University, Siliman University, Negros Oriental State University, Norso, 
and St. Paul University frequently bring their students to Liptong Woodland to learn about native trees. Nor so mid Liptong Woodland as their laboratory of forestry class. Today, I will be presenting about rainforestation farming as I experienced it. By 2010, fruit seedlings and native tree seedlings like Samar Gisok, Apitong Anyakal from the Bisaya State University were brought through to Mantikil by Dr. Marlito Bandi, where also I also cultivated about 25 hectares of public land. More than one hectare was planted with fruit trees mixed with native trees. I was once a Kainginero, Aslas unborn farmer. I roam in the mountains of Santa Catalina and Mount Talines. Hence, when mountain climbing became a favorite pastime of young and adventurous, I was their favorite mountain guide. I was hired by Seliman University Biology Department through Mr. Crescencio Lomhod. Mr. Lomhod was not a college graduate, but was sent by Dr. Angel Alcala to the University of the Philippines. Our work was used by scientists and experts in writing the book Guide to Philippine Birds and Amphibians, Bats and Reptiles. Mostly of my life, I spent living in the mountain. I have witnessed the destruction of the forest and deterioration of the whole envir environment. My vision is to make Negros Island green again. The deforestation of Negros Island by Hini and Regalado in 1980, 1998, the book entitled Vanishing Creature of the Philippine Rainforest. Now you can see uh, in the early years, you can see how the, the, in 1875, the forest of Negros Island was very thick and only along the beaches were cultivated by people. And 1949, as the population grew, the forest also became smaller. And in 1970, the population became so high and in, it becomes millions. And in 1987, uh, the forest patches was already very small. And then in 1992, after martial law, the forest in Negros Island was only about 4%. I worked with various groups like Friends of the Environment and Negros Oriental, FINOR, which gave me a break when they nominated me to the Ramon Abuetes Foundation, incorporated rapid triennial awards, which I won the first prize. Now I work with Department of Environment and Natural Resources. They granted me a tenural instrument which allows me to use land I am occupying as well as developing it for several years. Now I am being paid to plant native trees, which I am, uh, I and my companions will take care and protect for three years until it can survive on its own. Now listen, lear lessons learned. Plant enough number of trees that you can take care. Networking and linkaging paved the way to get the help of people who are interested uh, in rainforestation. By word of mouth and later the social media help in promoting my rainco sites, as well as inform prints in appreciating our native flora, fauna and flora. The appearance of the blowing pita in my rainco last 2018, at the time this bird was last seen in Basilan 111 years ago. But it came to my rainco last March 2018, this proves that birds and other wildlife animals are just scanning the environment where they can hide and perhaps mix their nest without fear of being hunted. Money or finances will just come if we are consistent in our work and advocacy. Blessings just come our ways as we are good stewards of God creation. I am grateful that I applied what I learned from the, the training and assistance provided by the Bisaya State University and Yale University to, through ALTI.
Okay, thank you so much, Sir Rene, for your very, very wonderful presentation. It is inspiring to learn about how many different groups and individuals you have worked with and would be great to learn more about those projects. So now, Sir Fadi and Sir Rene, uh, since you already activated your cameras and please activate also your microphone. So as a reminder to everyone, you can type questions in the Q&A section of your screen and we will get to as many as we can over the next 20 minutes. So this presentation and Q&A session is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel in the next few days. So uh, let me start with this question. Number one, uh, what do you think are the biggest obstacles to people adopting rainforestation farming? So any one of you, Sir Rene and Sir Tadi, can start with answering that question. Yeah, okay, Joy, hi, uh, good morning to all. Uh, one of the common questions uh, and challenges, uh, I, I presume, is actually the, the way how to uh, propagate some of the varieties of the of native seedlings. But um, with our experience, if we will work with the people's organization, with the community partners, they are the ones who are uh, always in the forest and uh, uh, they know actually some of the varieties of the trees that can be produced or uh, that, can, that are difficult to produce or that are uh, easier to produce and um, I think one of the issues here is that uh, uh, in producing the native seedlings of course if we are if, if we are sourcing it in the, the protected areas uh, one of the challenges is that we should always uh, ask the permission for example of the protected area management board so as for them to, to monitor of how much of these uh, planting materials are being taken from the forest but uh, for the reinforestation training that we are giving to our to the different stakeholders and even to the private sector, we are really trying to explain them technically uh, on a per species basis on how to produce these uh, native seedlings. Of course, if you are not familiar with a particular variety of trees, you, you will not be able to produce it on the proper way. Thank you, Sir Tadi. Okay, how about Serene? You have something to add? Let me repeat the question again. What do you think are the biggest obstacles to people adopting rainforestation farming? Um, okay. Uh, learning, learn the learnings in the previous uh, education, uh, maybe it must be changed. Um, people should be promote uh, sh teachers should promote in the school that planting native trees is uh, very important and then it's not true that it's slow growing um, a lot of native trees are fast growing much even faster than the introduced ones and then um, I think it's uh, it's not easy to convince the, the older generation but for the younger generation generation it's much more easier, especially when you have something to present, like you bring them to Lipton Woodland and then show them that this is the performance of the growth of native trees. So, of course, sometimes they are also laws by the government that also make people um, I think not to plant native trees. Like if they plant native trees, then they will get uh, something they will get into trouble if they cut one of their trees that they planted. Maybe we could make a law that if they plant 25 native trees, once they grow up, they can cut uh, maybe five for um, for lumber consumption. So um, there is a problem also in legislation. So they must make they must uh, make a law in the Congress that they should uh, promote planting native trees, and then they can also give incentives to people who are poor to plant native trees. The, uh, that's only few that I could suggest. Thank you, Sir Ite. Okay, great, thank you. Um, our next question 
has to, uh, I think is directed to you, Sir Tadi, and it has to do with Haribon's ridge to reef uh, approach, which you mentioned in your presentation. Could you yeah. explain a little more about what what that approach is? Um, are you, you know, basically what part of that continuum from ridge to reef are you uh, actively involved in? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, David, for that. And uh, the question is, was it all forest covered? Was restoration a helpful approach to, to every section of the landscape? Well, the answer is, of course, restoration is a very helpful approach. And, but it doesn't mean that we will plant all areas that we, we see in the landscape. Of course, we are prioritizing the areas or the forests that were previously forested. That's why uh, the, the rainforestation is also an approach of reforestation. Uh, the difference is that it uses the native trees in uh, planting these areas. And uh, why do we consider our work as a ridge to reef? Uh, because first we are doing initiatives in the uplands uh, we are partnering with the farmers and as well we are also we do also have some projects in the coastal areas uh, in the mangroves since uh, mangrove is also a forest and uh, in in between these areas like for example in some private areas we do have previous initiatives also in advocating and planting native trees in in the in this area so uh, what i mean is that uh, we are trying to to plant native trees in all possible areas that uh, can be planted like for example in in uh, in the different uh, urban areas in the municipality uh, but it doesn't mean that all of the areas will be planted um, the planting should conform with the different land use plans of the different lgus Okay, great, thank you. Okay, okay so um, maybe the next question is also related to what you've also mentioned, Sir Thaddy, about uh, the, this restoration approach. So, or maybe Sir Rene can also add to this. So uh, what happens to species that cannot be matched to a particular site? Okay, should I answer or Sir, Sir Rene? All right. I, I, you I can, can also start. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, if, if you may, um, of course, uh, in before we, we start the restoration in every site, uh, we do have the, the survey of the different uh, varieties of the flora. And uh, from our experience, most of the, the trees that are being planted really matches the site. Why? Because uh, we source the, the seeds and wide links from the mother trees that are within that specific geographic location. So uh, our rule of thumb is that uh, we should uh, choose those uh, varieties of trees that are uh, definitely, if possible, within that restoration area. So we are trying to uh, multiply the remaining uh, native trees in the area. And if none, uh, we will be um, looking or sourcing some of these varieties in the more adjacent or nearest uh, that particular barangay. So that is our experience for that. How about Sereni? So in, in, your, in some uh, of your, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, sir. Go, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Please, uh, please uh, give me. Uh, Inside okay. Bunjan. So, uh, in your in some of your restoration sites, in maybe in your experience in Negros, so uh, what happens to those species that cannot be matched to a particular site? Um, and, um, you know, in Negros, we have different types of climate here. Um, in the Western portion, it's hot, so we have different types of forest. Uh, we call it Moves Decidos Evergreen Rainforest. So if we visit the area, we must try to study first the previous weather, what type of trees will survive, 
And then like in the eastern part, there is more rain, especially during the easter, easter least winds like this season. There is so much rain, so it, the forest is uh, lowland evergreen rainforest in the lower portion, but not in the higher one, in the higher elevation, there are different types of trees. So um, we must sure, uh, we, we want to be sure that the trees we, are, we will be planting will survive. So um, the adaptation of the trees in the area and then also the the wildlife matter so what types of wildlife are present so and uh, like in the grasslands of course we have the grass owl so we must not uh, plant trees all the grasslands because uh, if we will we will be planting trees on the grasslands all the grasslands will disappear and then the grass owls will have no more uh, areas to stay and the grass birds so it, it, we must have a very uh, specific study on the area also. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, our next question is, is about whether there is a tradition of agroforestry in the Philippines. Um, and, and maybe a little bit broader would be, is there a kind of traditional ecological knowledge that gets integrated into your approach to rainforestation? And that's, that's a question for either of you. Uh, uh, sorry, David. Sorry, David, I was not able to hear the, the question. Can you repeat? Oh, sorry, the, the question was whether there are traditional forms of agroforestry in the Philippines and more broadly, the way that kind of indigenous knowledge is or is not integrated into the rainforestation farming that you work with local communities to implement? Yes, uh, in, in case of Haribon, um, I think if, if, if we partner with the indigenous people, uh, of course we consider their, their knowledge. Uh, and um, since uh, reinforestation technology is, uh, I can say, is also a form of agroforestry. Uh, however, uh, with uh, the different initiatives of Haribon, uh, we, we are, of course, we are using the native trees. But uh, when it comes to the livelihood uh, preferences of the community partners, we always consider them if whatever... Uh, for example, whatever livelihood they want, if they want, uh, of course, uh, some fruit trees, uh, this should be planted in, in their, for example, in their backyard. Or we should always go after what is being uh, uh, implied by the law, for example, in the different uh, land uses which I am mentioning earlier. So if in, for example, in protected area, uh, there are certain portions that uh, fruit trees are not being allowed to be planted, especially in seed protection zones, more, wherein most of the premium species should be planted in, in those particular sites. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Tateita, do you have anything you would like to add? Um, yeah, like a lot. indigenous knowledge is also very important to me. Like A lot of my knowledge in trees comes from the of course, the native names, I, I know it because of the indigenous people. I have worked with um, indigenous people in Binalbagan and they have, uh, their culture is very different from the culture in the school. So they have their own learnings and then um, in, in, in introducing their, our knowledge about rainforestation farming, uh, it must be mixed with their learnings uh, also. You have to like in the Philippines, you have to make a halo-halo to make it more mixed with uh, yeah, make traditional knowledge mixed with scientific knowledge in the universities, makes a good test. Great, thank you. Okay, so you can see uh, their experiences now. And then now, uh, next question, it, it's I think specific for Serene. What is the impact of your advocacy 
with regards to your coca ingineros before. So did they sympathize with you or they continue kaingin today? I'm not, uh, so that's a very good, a very, very nice question. And I, you know, at the first time, I got, I got a hard time convincing uh, because they say that, how, how did it, it, it happen that you, you become a um, biodiversity conservation advocate in preserving native and then you were a hunter before. So there is a, um, a length of time before they were convinced. Uh, but when the, one of my, um, like when I won the award, I was nominated and then so the first award I was given was in my hometown. And then the people in my hometown uh, changed their mind because uh, uh, I was given an award. And then oh, when I was given the award in the national level, uh, regional or national, like Ramon Abuete, so uh, it's more easy to convince people. And then the, a lot of people changed their mind that uh, even if we are bad before, we can be good in the future. Great, thank you, sir. All right, so the next question, which is relevant for both of you, um, is about, well, particularly for Sir Tabby, has to do with livelihood support for the communities you work with uh, through Higher Bones Tree for Life program. What kind of community support uh, do you provide? Yes, thank you. Uh, th like, thank you, David, for that answer, and also, I also saw some questions addressed to me. Well, of course, uh, with, with your question, um, the livelihood that uh, we give to uh, to the community partners is not just the, the financial, uh, the, the direct or a dole out. It's not a dole out uh, support. Uh, we first uh, capacitate uh, the community partners, uh, and we at first we do the. Uh, for example, the TNA or the training needs assessment, the capacity building that they they need, uh, the resource inventory on in in their site, what can be matched uh, with this uh, possible uh, um, livelihood program that can be that can be given to them. Uh, if for the Forest for Life movement, uh, for the span of three years, the, our community partners are receiving on a regular basis every quarter, every three months, uh, the incentives in uh, maintaining uh, this, the, the sites or the seedlings. Of course, there are also incentives in producing the payment for the seedlings. And not just the, for the maintenance, we do, of course, provide the livelihood fund. And before providing the livelihood fund, of course, we are capacitating them. We are trying to, to match what is really the appropriate well, livelihood uh, for them. And uh, also, aside from this, we also provide provision, uh, the provision for the fruit bearing trees that, that should be planted in appropriate sites. And uh, it's up for them if uh, they, they consume the, the fruits of the trees uh, in their household, or if they can uh, sell the, those seedlings. And uh, since the partnership of FFL is not only with the community partners, we really try to tap the local government units. So after the three years of partnership with the, uh, with the POs, with the people's organization, we are trying to, uh, with the partnership, we really require the LGUs to provide in their annual investment plan, the sustainability of these initiatives. So that, uh, and we are also tapping the different offices of the LGU so that there will be sustainability in terms of livelihood with the people's organization. Okay, great. Thanks, Sir Tadi. Ate, would you like to add anything? Uh, I think your microphone is muted. Um, it's now okay, sir. So when I work with the uh, Indigenous people in Binalbagan, um, I gave trainings to to them about um, creating, establishing a nursery 
So now they are happy. And, uh, they're because I don't have uh, funding, uh, like money for to finance them. So I just give learnings, and they are now happy earning the proceeds from their nursery. So it's also a livelihood to create a nursery. Okay, great. Thank you. So maybe we can still entertain one or two questions. Um, <clears throat> there's a question uh, to Sir Thaddy. Maybe Sir Ipe can also add to this. The people are used to harvest the forest for various uses. So how do you make sure they don't go back to destroy the very forest you are trying to restore? Uh, thank you, Joy, for that uh, uh, question. Uh, of course, what I have mentioned earlier, uh, for example, in our site in the Southern Sierra Madre, uh, in one of our partners there, uh, they are farmers, but before engaging with Haribon, they are actually the illegal uh, poachers within the site. Uh, but now, after we have trained them with the rainforestation technology, and from since 2000, um, 2012, uh, we have partnership. Uh, they were really honest that they were in the past are cutting trees, but uh, today they were able to uh, uh, to earn from the seedling production, and uh, they really want to partner with uh, with Harim, Haribon because they want to have sufficient number of trees in their area because of the whitewater rafting uh, site. And they, uh, we are glad because they know that uh, the more trees, the more uh, water will be produced by particular forests eventually. And um, um, just like what I have mentioned uh, earlier, we, we really, aside from the capacity building and uh, financial incentives that we provide, we tap the local government units. And not, all of the, not only the local government, but also the national government agencies, uh, we try to to tap some of the capacity buildings as well that they can also provide aside from what Harriwan uh, provides. Okay, thank you, Sir Tadi. How about Sir Epe? Do you still have something to add on that? Uh, yeah, like, like for example, here in my hometown, Bakong, and then it's, uh, we have sometimes before, when I was a barangay captain, we have a very huge problem about water, um, water scarcity. Uh, scarcity. scarcity. And then when uh, the our mayor was convinced to uh, restore, um, it's not reforest, but we restore the water seed. And then now we have so much water. So the people themselves are now protecting the forest by their own because uh, the notice that once the forest is established again, then our water supply is also getting so good. Uh, it's more than enough for the people. We have a question here from one of our participants uh, of this session come, calling in from Colombia in South America. It's so neat to see uh, the cross-continental collaboration that could emerge from this and inspiration. So Catherine asks, uh, what do you recommend or what are the key messages that could be applied to other countries from your experience? So like Colombia, but it could be anywhere. Uh, what, what's a key takeaway that you would like to share to inspire others outside of the Philippines? And this could be for David and, and Joy as well after our main speakers. <laughs> Uh, okay uh, maybe for, for for me uh the key messages the takeaways is that there are two uh basically the technical and the, the social aspect in restoration uh the technical uh just like what like what Tata Ite has mentioned and Haribon it is the species site matching we should match really the, the trees that should be planted on the site and second is the social acceptance because what in any in, in any project whatever the project will be if uh, the project will not be supported by the local people this will not be successful in, in the end so i guess that's the two main um, key message that i can share 
what the NGO support. Tatayita, do you have any kind of key messages you would provide to somebody who is not from the Philippines? Mm, here in the Philippines, is uh, uh, the most important thing is to establish friendship. And then, uh, yeah, when you, you, you establish friendship and then um, people will try to learn from you and then honesty. It's very important. If you are just, if you are honest, then the people will believe in you. Then uh, um, give your, give also your, share your learnings. And then what you have done is just uh, when they will see um, what you are doing, it more than words. It's more than words what they see from you. Like um, yeah, if you have something, a package to show them that this is the best thing to do. And, and, and I would just like to add uh, to, to what Tataita said, just to kind of add context is, is he's been incredibly successful as a, a rainforestation proponent. Um, he, he, he attended the training and he, you know, the area around his house, which is what a hectare in size, maybe a little less, he devoted that land to planting native trees. And he has so many people coming to visit him and, you know, it doesn't take much to convince them when they see, you know, Tataita's dedication and the, the, the excellent performance that the trees are, are doing um, in the area around his house. I think it's very hard to, to visit Tataita's house without being convinced um, that this is a, a, you know, a great thing to do. Um, that by, by far has been the, you know, the greatest selling point. And, and, you know, there have been so many people, so many organizations that have come to visit um, Lipton Woodland and that have, you know, decided to try to adopt that approach on their own. So, you know, it doesn't, I mean, it, it doesn't always require a lot of money or a big organization. It can take, you know, one person who's dedicated and passionate to make a huge difference. So thank you. Yeah, and, and also uh, I'd like to ask, I, I add also that uh, my idea also of Tata Ite, he is not a graduate student. He's just a high school level, but the, the passion that he already has has been uh, shared to a lot of people. So one thing that I can also share to other people outside the Philippines is that um, educate, educate, continue educating the communities. So they, they will learn from the academe but that or the researchers like us but us the researchers and academics can also learn a lot from them so it's just a, a two-way um, uh, movement of sharing our knowledge so uh, continue educating it's it's not a an easy thing but they can they can really we can really do restoration activity a very successful one if we can if we can uh, share our knowledge our experiences to to other people so unfortunately <laughs> we have run out of time so i'd like to thank sir tadi and sir rene for their wonderful presentation and willingness to address so many questions i would like to thank everyone for logging in around the world for joining us today so as we wrap up i would like to share some resources and an upcoming uh, learning opportunity so first learn more about lp's work at our website at lt.yale.edu. If you go to the events page, you will see that we have some upcoming events in lt.yale.edu slash events. And now uh, next in the coming months, we will be announcing the call for applicants to our one year certificate program uh, entitled Tropical Forest Landscapes, Con Conservation, Restoration and Sustainable Use. If you are interested in learning more about the program, please explore our websites or feel free to contact us directly through our website, tropicalrestorationcertificate.yale.edu and uh, our email, tropicalcertificate.yale.edu. And then mm -hmm. next is, uh, we, would like, we would also like to encourage to sign up for LT's events and mailing list. You can find the sign up box at the bottom of each page. And next, uh, check out our videos on YouTube, youtube.com, uh, Yale LP.
And lastly, thank you once again to everyone for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you soon. And please keep safe, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, speakers. Thank yeah, you, everyone. Thank you, Tate. Thank you, Tadi. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.